there's not one word that I understood, not even one. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I couldn't think of anyone better to close out our series thinking about how faith and work interact um, than UCLA's professor of space physics. Please would you welcome uh, Jacob Bortnick. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. It's a lot of fun. I especially want to welcome um, anyone and everyone who's new and visiting us today. If you're visiting church for the first time, welcome. If you are just exploring the Christian faith, I'd like to give you a special um, shout out. Uh, it feels like it wasn't that long ago that I was sort of in the same situation. I was sitting where you're sitting, uh, well, 22 years ago now. But walking into church for the first time with all my questions and doubts and curiosity and reservations and just kind of wondering, um, is this real? Is this anything at all? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was not a Christian at the time, but um, I was a graduate student. I was doing my dissertation. I was newly married. I was going through the Alpha course. And if uh, I know some of you are going through the Alpha course. If you haven't, it's such a wonderful resource, a series of videos exploring the Christian faith and kind of trying to answer all the basic questions that people typically have. I was going through the Alpha course, and we were just learning about faith and this kind of radical trust, radical obedience, right? How do you trust the Lord? Um, in my work, I was actually fairly stuck. Uh, my, my research was very coding heavy. I, I would have to write a lot of code. I was writing this piece of code. I was stuck on it for days and days. It was actually starting to drive me a little crazy, to be honest. And um, I thought, well, all right, let's do a little experiment, shall we? So I, uh, I thought, I'm gonna pray that God fixes my code because I have tried everything that I can and I cannot do it. And so I prayed that God would fix my code, but to make things more interesting, I thought, I'm just gonna step out of my cubicle and I'm gonna stand in the hallway and I'm just gonna wait until God fixes my code. <laughs> I don't recommend this approach, but <laughs> I was standing in the hallway not even five minutes, and a good friend of mine, whose name I cannot mention, my wife told me, do not mention names. I cannot mention, but this friend came walking along in the hallway, and we started chatting about something unrelated, and, um, you know, I got drawn into the conversation. He was a good friend. He worked a few cubicles down from me. Started talking, and uh, as we were talking, we kind of started migrating back to my cubicle, and then two unusual things happened. The first is that he sat down in my seat, which is, was very unusual because that's a big no-no. It's kind of my personal space. I don't really like that. But he sat down there, and as we were chatting, he was looking at me, and he was looking at my monitor, and he was looking at me, and looking at my monitor. And at some point, he just kind of stopped. And out of the many windows that were open on my monitor, he pointed to my code. He pointed to the front line. Now, this, you've got to realize, was some kind of arcane Unix shell scripting language, if this means anything to you. And he said... You know, if you don't put this little cryptic flag right out front here, tippity tippity type, it's going to result in erratic behavior. And so he did it, and the code worked. And I was like, clunk, what? <laughs> this works. <laughs> it worked. I was, I just didn't know the rules. I was such a, you know, I wasn't even a Christian at the time. I was just such a newbie. I was such a baby in the faith. I didn't know what the rules were. I didn't know what you were supposed to pray for and not pray for. I just prayed for everything. And it was great. It was only until years later that I sort of, you know, got this feeling that for some people, they separated what goes on on Sunday, the worship we do, and then going back on Monday and just kind of living life, um, you know, as you typically would. And they just... It always seemed like that was kind of wrong to me. Um, in fact, if you remember uh, what Ben was preaching just a few weeks ago about being Colossians 3.23 type of workers, and here's the verse now. Uh, Colossians 3.23 says, uh, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not as working for human masters. Right, workers working for the Lord. Sometimes you run across these people in your life and it's just wonderful, they're like gems. I mean, imagine if you, you know, go to the doctor and you have some serious medical condition and the doctor stops and he treats you and the problem you have 
as their worship, as their ministry, right? How wonderful is that? It's so, uh, imagine if people all over the world did this all the time, it would be amazing. And I try and kind of bring this attitude to my own work, I don't always get it right, but you know, you can only sort of come in with that attitude and I try and I interact with a lot of faculty, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, you know, I interact with people and y you try and be alive, you try and bless. Sometimes um, people are angry, right? People are frustrated uh, and it's, you know, they kind of bring their own issues, but um, here's the sort of secret weapon. When someone comes at me and they're angry, I kind of get a little bit excited. I think, ah, oh, you're gonna see something different. Right, I start, I start praying to the Holy Spirit to kind of show me what goes on. I kind of remind myself that anger is just fear, trying to be brave. And I ask the Lord, what is, what is it that they're afraid of? What is it that they're trying to protect so dearly? Right, kind of try and do that. So today I'm going to talk about what I do, and I'll talk about my specific context. And, uh, you know, we all do different things. We all have different contexts. We work in different areas. But do try and look for the common threads, kind of the things that are common and similar to what you do. So with that said, let me tell you a little bit about my job. Um, as Ben mentioned, I'm a faculty at UCLA. My main area is space physics and machine learning. I have a group of students and postdocs and researchers. I'm also the, the head of my department, uh, what they call the department chair. I'm also the director of the UCLA Space Institute. So I, I kind of wear a lot of hats. I interact with a lot of our senior administration. I interact with students. I kind of cross the gamut. And so, uh, what is it that I do? So if we can have a slide, um, this is what uh, a lot of my friends think I do. So, uh, you know, sage on a stage, I speak, my students and postdocs, uh, you know, listen in rapture to every word I say. Uh, then there is Einstein, you know, smoking a pipe, thinking deep thoughts, elbow patches are vital for this exercise to think deep thoughts. You know, Richard Feynman standing in front of a blackboard full of equations, just spilling wisdom all over the place and, you know, pondering the deep mysteries of space and the universe. Uh, I wish that were true. The reality is more like this. Top left, Zoom meetings. Many Zoom meetings. Occasionally, Zoom meetings turn into in-person meetings, and so those can last a while. So there are many, many interactions, Zoom meetings, in-person meetings. Um, you know, when I'm not in those, I'm in the right hand, uh, right side where it's just like, ah, frantic things. There's a hundred emails and I gotta do this and this and this and that and that. And there's like, you know, a thousand things that pull at your time and your to-do list. And occasionally there's a moment to speak to students in my group and time to do some work um, on my laptop. Uh, and so, so, so that's the environment. That's the day-to-day. -day. I mean, the day-to-day -day is not, um, you know, it can be a bit of a scramble. Um, it can be a bit of a hustle. It's the environment. For all the good things about academia, and don't get me wrong, there are many wonderful things. Um, higher education is still a, a fantastic engine for upward social mobility, right? Students that come from disadvantaged backgrounds can really soar. I mean, they can, they can do so well. And there are wonderful things about it, but there are some things about it that are fairly negative, and, and those things are mostly having to do with it being a very competitive environment. Uh, the faculty, the researchers, the students, they're all vying for kind of that big attention, those big discoveries, the nature papers, the, the headlines in the newspapers. The environment, maybe the common thing with many of you is that it's a very achievement-oriented environment. Not necessarily financial, but status, attention. It's an achievement-oriented environment, and that can have a toxic side. Right, what are the toxic sides? Uh, well, people work a lot. It can be, um, there's a tendency for workaholism. Some of my colleagues, I will tell you frankly, have a 70-hour work week as a baseline. That's just when they're not busy, uh, right? And so with that come uh, sacrifices, sacrificing relationships, health, uh, your faith, your well-being. There can also be high rates of burnout, both of faculty and students. And that's kind of like what happens when you sacrifice everything for this goal of achievement, right? I think that's a fairly common thing in some of these industries. There's also uh, a lot of fear. Our next slide here shows a wonderful table. If you can't read it, the green says, people who get imposter syndrome. You guys know what imposter syndrome is? 
I've got a little definition here. It's the inability to believe that your success is deserved and has been legitimately achieved. That's imposter syndrome. You believe you're an imposter, you're just kind of like trying to pretend everything's cool and hopefully nobody finds out that you don't know anything, you shouldn't really be there and you don't belong. That's imposter syndrome. The greens, people who get imposter syndrome, right, it's a little, little fraction of the pie. The orange is other people who get imposter syndrome and the blue is everyone else who literally also gets imposter syndrome. <laughs> We all experience it, uh, and why is that? Why is it that everyone has these tendencies to overwork, tendencies to have imposter syndrome, right? Why, what's driving it? What's driving it is that there's a lot of fear underneath. When you peel back the layers, and you don't have to dig very deep, there's a lot of fear underneath. And the fear goes something like this. Without your achievements, who are you? Peel back all the stuff on your CV without your accolades, without your fancy position, without your medals and awards, who are you? Right? That's the fear. Take a step further. Are you worthy of love? <clears throat> right? Will you be abandoned? Do you, do you not matter? If you're not working your tail off, do you not matter, and will you be abandoned? Right? That's the common thread here. So today we're going to talk about what I do, uh, my particular environment, my context, and I want to specifically talk about how do you survive, how do you thrive, and how do you kind of reflect God's light and glory in that kind of a very achievement-oriented environment. So before we go on, let's have our reading. I believe there's a handsome gentleman who is going to read for us. The reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your, ho your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Get a slice of that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, be the light, right? I love this. Uh, this passage comes from um, a larger kind of it's, uh, the, the context is that Jesus is giving the Sermon, sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 5 through 7, some of the just wisest and most profound words you'll ever read. Right, that Jesus is just kind of laying it out there, and sometimes it's difficult, and sometimes it's, you know, be the light, and sometimes it's uh, be the salt, and if you lose your saltiness, you get thrown out, right? It's sort of, this is um, how you know it's truth, because it sometimes feels a little uncomfortable. It sometimes rubs you the wrong way, and Jesus says here, be the light, and, um, and why is that? The light is to glorify God, right? It's to reveal. The light is for others, to be a light that reveals to others, right? Ben preached a few weeks ago that um, it's not exactly that we're full of light, that we have all this light and we're so amazing. It's more like that when we position ourselves to face God, we're like mirrors. We reflect the light that God has, right? We're reflecting God's glory. And that's what he means by being the light. So my point number one is to be the light. Be the light wherever you are. Uh, this picture here is very cool. Let me tell you a bit about it. This summer, my family and I were very fortunate. We went down to New Zealand in July. We saw the FIFA Women's World Cup, which was awesome. Uh, we, we went to, down to Hobbiton, where they filmed the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. And we got to do this thing. This is called the Waitomo Glowworm Caves. And the way it goes is the bottom there is a river. And so you get into a boat with a whole bunch of people and they paddle you out ever so slowly into this cave. 
And within a minute, it gets dark. It gets super dark. It is like the darkest dark you've ever seen. It's so dark you can't see your hand in front of your face. And another minute after that, as your eyes start to adjust, this magical thing happens. The whole ceiling starts to light up. And these are little glowworms. You see, this is a real picture. It's just a long exposure. These are glowworms. These are the tiniest little lights. You'd never, ever see them except when it's so dark. If you had to light up a match in that cave, it would look like a tractor beam. It would be so bright. And what is the point? The point is in an achievement-oriented society, there's negativity, there's darkness. Even the brightest, even the tiniest little glowworm light, even the tiniest little match is a huge light in that environment. Right? Wherever you are, especially if you're in an environment which is dark, you are the light, right? You are the little match. The darker it is, the brighter you shine, the more important it is that you be there, right? So, so shine brightly. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes there is darkness. Uh, and we'll talk about what to do to gird up for that. So be the light. Uh, the next point that I wanted to make is I'm going to take a step back into the world of science. And so uh, my next slide, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, a fun little experiment. This was done in the 1970s, a guy called Mark Lepper. Uh, this was at Stanford University. And uh, what they do is they have a little child care center there. It's called the Bing Children's Center. You enroll your kids. It's a wonderful place. But they do experiments on your kids. So <laughs> So one of these experiments uh, went as follows. Uh, the researcher, Mark Lepper, identified a whole bunch of kids that enjoyed drawing and coloring in. And when you leave stuff on the table, they would naturally just sit down and just start drawing happily. <clears throat> and so he divided these kids into two groups. The one group, they just left alone. That was the control group. And they just enjoyed coloring in. And they just did their thing. And it was glorious. It was wonderful for them. The other group enjoyed drawing just as much but they started getting little rewards for it. Little gold stars, little motivational things, little, little trinkets, like little rewards, little prizes. So they did that for a few weeks, and then they came back, put all the kids together again, gave them all their drawing materials on the tables. The first group, who was just you know, doing their drawing because they loved doing their drawing, just sat down as always, enjoyed themselves as much as ever. The second group, who started getting the gold stars, were not interested anymore. They weren't interested. The motivation had changed. Okay, this is the difference. Mark Lepper was um, very famous because he discovered the difference between intrinsic motivation, doing something for the love and the joy of doing it, enjoying the, the grind, the activity, right? The doing it, versus extrinsic motivation, doing something because someone else is gonna give you something, a star, money, status, recognition, approval. Extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. Neuroscientists have a much better understanding of how this works now. Uh, it has to do with two neurotransmitters. Uh, one is called norepinephrine, another one is called dopamine. Norepinephrine is like a stress hormone. It gets you out of bed, gets you motivated, gets, gives you a little bit of you know, a push in your day. You do what you gotta do. Dopamine gives you kind of the pleasure, the satisfaction. The question is, what do you attach? What is the dopamine attached to? Is it attached to the friction, to the grind, to the activity itself? Or is it attached to the reward? And many of the top performers, sportsmen, musicians, uh, top performers have discovered that attaching your dopamine release to the reward uh, is bound to fail. It is, it is to the grind. It is to the activity itself. And so how do we use that? to be Colossians 3.23 Christians, right? How do we do that? We think of our motivation for work. You know, are we motivated by money, uh, status, extrinsic factors, or are we motivated by this desire to worship and follow God and to do his will and to be the light in our darkness, right? In what areas of your life have you started chasing the gold star as opposed to doing the coloring in, right? How have you transferred that motivation, the dopamine release? And how do you get back to being Colossians 3.23 Christian? All right, the second point that I wanna make 
is to grow your roots. Uh, and what you see there is an iceberg. And uh, when you take a boat out in um, Alaska or such, uh, you will see the iceberg. But what you're actually seeing is only 10% of the iceberg. You're just seeing the top of it, right? That very, very top part, that's the visible part. That's the part that's beautiful and it shines. But that part is only possible because of the bottom part, the hidden part. There's 90% of your iceberg, virtually, you know, almost the entire iceberg is there under the water. It's invisible, it's hidden. You can only see the top part because the bottom part exists. And our faith life is like that. If we're gonna be a light in our work, if we're gonna be um, a blessing to others, if we're gonna be Colossians 3.23 Christians, we have to work on our bottom part. We have to grow our roots, right, in order for us to be effective. So um, why do we do this? Why do we even, why do we even do this? Like, why would we w want to be a light and to tell people that we're Christians and want them to follow Jesus in the first place? I want to turn a little bit to um, John chapter 15. And I think he gives the answer here. He says, uh, and this is Jesus speaking now to his disciples. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing, right? What does the vine gives to it, give to its branches? It gives water, nutrients, life, sustenance, right? In order for the branches to be green and healthy, they need to be strongly connected to the vine. They need to get all of that life force from the vine. And in the same way, we need to be very firmly planted in Jesus. He continues to say, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that basically dries up, is thrown away, and it's withered. Uh, such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And then he goes on to say, this is to my Father's glory. So we come back again to the Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We do all this so that Jesus' joy can be in us and our joy can be complete. And it's not a joy that's attached to extrinsic factors, to salary, to status, to gold stars. It's a joy that is attached to God's will, to working as worship, to righteousness. Right? It's an intrinsic joy that we follow God. And, and that's why we do this. So this is essentially what we've been talking about this entire series. Right? It's how do we do our work? How do we worship? How do we... Um, how do we gather and scatter, right? We gather together in groups and communities. We pray for each other. We strengthen each other. And then we scatter and we're out. And we're little tiny glowworms in the cave. We're matches, like we're lights in the darkness. Uh, if you're new uh, to Christianity and you are thinking about how do I grow that invisible part, my hidden life with God, <clears throat> I'd like to offer a couple of thoughts. So it's very simple. Um, you, you uh, read a little, right? You can uh, read a, a book of your Bible and you can uh, just, just read a little tiny bit, maybe just a minute, read a little, right? You pray a little, tell God all your needs. And the third part is you just be still a little. You listen a little, right? That's, that's the hidden part. This is where God gets to tell you about you. This is where God gets to tell you about his desires, how he sees you. And it's not something that you can just read or understand with your mind. It's something you need to experience. In fact, I'd love to do this together, if you don't mind. I'm actually gonna, this is actually paying homage to, um, to one of my favorite uh, people of all time. There's a guy called Fred Rogers. Maybe some of you have heard of him. He had a, a TV series called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. 
Uh, Fred Rogers actually trained as a minister, I believe, a Presbyterian minister. But in the early days of TV, he kind of saw that TV was being misused. It was, it was violence. It was indignation. People were throwing pies at each other. And he said, why are we lying to our kids this way? We're giving them this, such a weird, distorted image of what life and reality are like. Why don't you create a show just for kids? And in fact, no one was doing a show for kids in those days because that wasn't marketable. In fact, if you see documentaries about them, they say, think about all the good elements that make good TV. Excitement, variety, action, speed. Think about all those things now. Do exactly the opposite and you'll get Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> right? And his show, one of, one of the most successful of all times, ran 33 years, over 900 episodes. He got numerous awards, Presidential Medal of Freedom. He was a commencement speaker in multiple universities. Something that he liked to do during all these fancy speeches was to take a minute of stillness, just this island in time, to just be still, to be quiet, to listen. This is a person that allowed himself to be used by God, and God did such incredible things through him, right? More than a minister, more than um, a TV personality, he was someone that, that brought together his faith and his work, he was used by God. He had um, an incredible impact. He spoke to kids about their deepest needs uh, in a very simple yet dignified way. So, I would like to work on the 90% of our iceberg and take a minute where we experience the Holy Spirit. And the way this is gonna work is, um, I will pray and invite the Holy Spirit in. I invite you to please put your phones down uh, and not worry about that. I sometimes check my phone. This is more of an anxiety response because I think I'm missing something important. But in the next minute, I promise you that you won't. I invite you to lay your anxieties aside. And I invite you to just be open and listening to the Holy Spirit because he will speak to you. He loves to speak to you. So I will pray. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Wasn't that wonderful? That's how God speaks to us, right? Remember the prophet Elijah? There was all this stuff. He was looking for God in the fire and the earthquakes and the storms. But it was in the still, small voice. God was just like, hush down. Be quiet. I'll speak to you. That's how God speaks to us. Point number three that I'd like to make is the following. Um, can we do the next slide, please? So, we are about two months out of Christmas, and I know we will be busily writing our letters to Santa for uh, review by his elves to see if we've been good or bad. Uh, and, uh, and we'll also be celebrating Christmas with Jesus. And so I just kind of wanted to pose the question, what is the difference between Jesus and Santa? Okay, this is a time where you guys get to weigh in. We can all figure this out together. Okay, anybody? Does any, ben, you must have an idea. <laughs> 
Okay, anyone? Anyone? Yes. It's a reward system. You have to be good, uh, according to the elves, I think. And, and then you get your presents. We tell Santa what we want. Anybody else? Um, yeah, one is in the North Pole. That's right. Uh, also, you know, Santa is made up and he wears the Coca-Cola colors. And Jesus is a historical figure. But that's not exactly what I was going for. Um, <laughs> I think it seems to me like the main difference is for Santa, we tell him what we want. We say, Santa, these are the things that I want. These are my presents. I've earned these by being so good. This is what I want, Santa. Not so for Jesus. We don't tell Jesus what we want. We tell Jesus, may your kingdom come. May your will be done. May I do what you want. Here are the two most powerful words that I know to be a light in the darkness to transform the world. Here the two most, it's a two word prayer. It goes like this, use me, right? Use me, Lord, and mean it. And you just wait and see what the Lord is gonna do. So Ephesians 3.20 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and deep and high is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. The point is that when we submit our lives to Christ, when we say, use me, you have no idea what God can do. You cannot even imagine, according to the Bible, you cannot even think or imagine what God is able to do with you. I don't think Fred Rogers had any clue of what God was gonna do when he said to God, use me. The first part of that, if you notice, is that Paul writes, I'm praying to the Holy Spirit that you can even understand how much God loves you. You can't understand this by yourself. I pray that the Holy Spirit gives you an ability to even understand that. That's what I mean about growing your roots, right? It's about working on that 90% of your iceberg. I pray that God gives you an ability to understand, that he gives you the Holy Spirit, that you can understand, and out of that, God will launch you. He will use you in a way you cannot even imagine. Quick story before we wrap up. Uh, this is kind of funny. I was in South Africa about 15 years ago. I was doing a lecture tour for the South African National Space Agency. My host took me all around. I did a big uh, lecture you know, one evening. The next day I was leaving. And uh, I had my uh, stuff all packed in the car. It was a rental car. As I was leaving the space agency, there was a room of about a dozen people. And I kind of poked my head in. I meant to say, thank you for having me, goodbye. What I ended up saying was, is there anyone I can pray for before I go? And I was like, ooh. <laughs> Did not mean to say that. How do I backpedal out of this one graciously and go to my car? <laughs> um, and before I could do anything, a young student raised his hand. There was about a dozen people in the room, all scientists. I mean, I have no idea about their faith background. And he said, um, I have multiple sclerosis. Could you pray for me, please? I'm in the hospital often. My vision is going. Um, I have a lot of plans for my life, but I'm not actually sure if I can make these plans just because of my condition and the way it's going. And um, I thought to myself, oh boy. <laughs> so, in for a penny, in for a pound. I said, all right, everyone, gather around. Put your hands on him. We're going to pray together. And uh, I did get some confused looks, I must admit, but they did it. It was great. <laughs> so, 
uh, people put their hands on, I invited the Holy Spirit, just as I did. I did my best listening that I could, but I did not get anything. I prayed by the authority that Jesus has given us in the Holy Spirit, and I commanded the disease to leave. I said, how are you feeling? He said, no change. I said, okay, thank you for your honesty. I said, can we pray again? <clears throat> sure. So I, again, you know, commanded by the power of the Holy Spirit for the disease to leave, Asked him how he's feeling. He said, no change. I said, okay, one more time. So we did it again. Prayed again. Power of the Holy Spirit. I was like, come on, I'm giving it all I got. Come on, Holy Spirit, do it. And so I asked him, how are you doing? He said, no change. I was like, okay, thank you very much. I'll be going now. <laughs> so I left, and I, in my shame, I went out to the parking lot and kicked the tire of a car. But, you know, I have things to work on. That's for sure. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, the host that was having me there came out and he said, you know, I think you're doing the right thing. I think you're just being faithful. I think that's just, that's what you're supposed to be doing. And I was like, wow, brother, you have a better understanding of this than I do. But the cool thing is that about a year later, the student emailed me and he said, you know, I used to go to the hospital once or twice a month, uh, pretty bad. And in the past year, I've been back once, not even related to my multiple sclerosis. <laughs> so, you know, something happened, although at the time, um, I didn't think that anything was happening. And it's just, it's just not us. When we say to God, use me, it is, it's his. It's his thing. We are just there, you know, to be his hands and his feet. And so I'll conclude with that. Right? How do we be used? How do you be used? Number one is just be available. You know, just be open. Be available. God will use you, I promise. Uh, be the light and the salt. Be the truth wherever you are. And just know that you are truly Deeply loved. Right, I'm going to finish with a quote from a song by Fred Rogers, and it goes like this. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair, but it's you I like. Okay. Amen. Be blessed, you guys. <laughs>